glad that uh, we can join together to worship the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and also celebrate the mothers in our lives. We see we've got, um, there's the teaser, we have a vase of roses down there on the communion table, and those will probably come into play a little later in the service. But yeah, just glad that we can be together. The weather's finally feeling very summery. It's a nice, nice change. So I invite everyone to stand. I'll give us an opening word of prayer, and we'll get into a time of worship this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you that we can gather together freely and worship you. That we don't have to fear the threat of persecution, just leaving our houses this morning. And God, we pray that you would just straighten out our minds and hearts this morning. Lord, Sunday morning, family stuff, work stuff, all the stuff. There's always a, a habit of it creeping into our mind space and pulling our focus. But God, we ask that you would just help us to put all that other stuff down and spend this time focusing on you, Lord, focusing on the songs that we sing as we praise your name, focusing on remembering you in communion and acknowledging your great sacrifice for us on the cross and focusing on the words that our pastor will bring today. We're grateful, Lord, that you've given us these wonderful and good things to focus on. And we ask that we would be able to do all of this for your glory. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Rock up. 
Good morning. We've been, uh, Tuesday night Bible studies, we've been going through the Old Testament and either the names or the ideas of Jesus, what he represented in the Old Testament. And last week we hit Micah, and there's a verse in Micah that doesn't have anything to do with prophecy of Jesus or names of Jesus or anything, but I remember when I had an Old Testament class in college, our Bible professor said that if you want to sum up the entire Old Testament in one verse, it's Micah 6, 8. And Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Three things. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. And I was thinking about that, that in the life of Jesus, you would expect him to exemplify at least the first two, acting justly, which he did. I don't know how many times he called out the people who were exploiting other people, oppressing other people, doing injustice to other people. He called them out on what they were doing, on their hypocrisy, on the way they were cheating people. He threw everyone out of the temple specifically because of that, the way they were cheating people. He, he was all about justice and people being treated properly. And he was incredibly merciful at the same time. The people that came hurting, even the, the very rich people that came with an honest question, he was very merciful. He didn't tell them off, didn't somehow make them hold them accountable for you know what they might have done wrong he gave them his love and his solutions and his salvation but this walk humbly with your god i thought why would god as a human need to walk humbly he's god there's just no reason for god to walk humbly <laughs> he's god you would have thought he would do whatever he wants he would demonstrate he would be god but Jesus took a very, very different view of it, a very, very different plan and the way he acted because he didn't come to be God. He came to be our savior, our example, a human like us. That's what he came for. And so 
even Jesus, even God, did what the Lord required of us, all three of them, not just part of them, all of them in his life, and showed us how to walk humbly. And Paul says that in Philippians 2.8, he talks about Jesus being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So the humility of Jesus went beyond just being a nice person who wasn't showing off as being God, went all the way to dying for us on the cross, being humble enough to pay for our sins, being humble enough to have people taunt him and insult him <laughs> and call for his crucifixion and make fun of him on the cross. I mean, think about that. Someone's up there in unbelievable pain and you're making fun of him. That's what he took for us to pay for our sin, to give us forgiveness, to give us love. And so we can come this morning and take this bread, take the, it represents that broken body, take the cup that he said is the new covenant in his blood, and be thankful that we have a God who didn't act like a God here. He did miracles, he did wonderful things, but he acted like a humble human, like everything that God asked us to be. We can look at that and be grateful for that. Let's pray. Lord, we do come again, thankful for your body, thankful for your blood, thankful for all of you that you gave every day of your life for us. And finally on that cross, everything. And we ask that we can accept that forgiveness, accept that love, appreciate it as we come and take these elements in thankfulness for what you did. We thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, lover of my soul, all-consuming fire is in your gaze. Jesus, I want you to know Jesus. 
us and all this is for you for your glory and your fame it's not about me as if you should do things my way you alone are God and I surrender I surrender to your ways. Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. Wishing a happy uh, celebration time, a time of dignity and honor for all the mothers in our lives. Let's go to God in prayer, thanking him. Great God in heaven, I thank you that you've given us a good nurturing group of people around us that we call mothers. Lord, how in many ways we've been taught, touched deeply by our own mothers, but also by others who've nurtured us in different ways and have encouraged us and helped us become the people that we are to be right now. And Lord, we are grateful. Lord, I thank you that you've given us so many good provisions, so many good people to be thankful for, Lord, there are many people in this world right now that are distressed by a lot of problems going on, Lord. I pray you'd help them during their time of trial. Lord, you knew how tough it was for your son to go through his trials. Please have mercy on those of us who are going through big trials right now. Lord, help us always as a church to be a place of, of sanctuary and um, care and love. And always keep us being a people of prayer. Praying as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, starting with chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. This is a clash between the ideal and the real. How you wish certain things would be just the way that you have them in their mind and you find out they are not. And sometimes we can get actually very angry <laughs> about something like that. And such is the case here. In a lot of popular movies, some of this is... Um, uh, communicated in the metaphor of sports, whether it's like Rocky Balboa, who uh, used to be a champion, but then he got kind of fat and lazy and got off of his discipline and kind of fell apart. And then the coach comes, puts him in his place, gets him going again, or some championship team that became a bunch of goofballs and off focus on different things. Usually sports is the metaphor that communicates that type of message. Well, in this case, God is coach, and he is coming to his people, his Levites, who used to be awesome, but they're not anymore. They've let themselves go. And he's calling them in a very dramatic way to get back on the ball again. First, let's read the passage. Then we'll look at the two things in there that he kind of uses to, as an outline to make his point. It says this, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 of Malachi. And now you priests, this warning is for you. If you do not listen, and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them, because you have resolved not to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant with him was with him a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction, 
was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many away from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty and the people that seek instruction from his mouth. The first four verses, this is the first section, and he talks about the curse in that respect, not profanity, but the opposite of a blessing. And curses were a big deal in the Old Testament. And uh, to give you a kind of the sense of the priority, oftentimes it was given to negative reinforcement, <laughs> negative motivation, I should say, is a Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is one of the last chapters that Moses says out loud because he's dead by the end of the chapter. He only has like four more chapters after this. And in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, he talks about all the blessings that happen if you keep the law and all the curses that will happen if you do not. And those the, the first 14 verses are all the blessings. And then the next 54 verses are the curses. That's a ratio about of four to one. Four curses for every blessing. A lot of negative um, motivation, so to speak. Curses were a big deal back then. Not for the Christian nowadays. That day is over. But in the Old Testament, yeah. And what that curse is going to be, he makes it very tangible. And that's what this curse is about. He is going to put dung, animal dung, on the faces of the priests. That is odd. This is kind of a strange thing for God to say, don't you think? Um, hey, in the temple, the issue was defective sacrifices, diseased animals being sacrificed rather than prime animals. Hey, and wherever you're going to have livestock, you're going to have stuff, right? And so God is saying, I am going to put this on your faces, on your descendants' faces, and so on. Um, I can imagine with priests, their concept was, oh, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get it ordained. I'm going to be anointed with oil. You know, like from uh, Psalm 23, thou anointest my head with oil. Isn't that nice? God is telling them here, you have not done what you're supposed to do. I'm going to anoint you all right, <laughs> but it's not with oil. It's going to be with something else that you find in the temple. Yeah, feces on the faces. That's pretty brutal. You see, the thing is, God is trying to make an important point here. Because the temple was a place where you got to see in tangible, quantifiable ways spiritual concepts. The concept that my sin causes something to die was graphic when you put your hand on another animal's, an animal's head and slit its throat. It died for your sin. That was right there, graphic and tangible and quantifiable. And so, but a lot of the priests thought, hey, we're doing an okay enough job. And God wants them to know how he sees what they're doing. And he's going to put the feces on the faces. Quantifies. See, God believes in quantifying. Hey, quantifying is what we do with things that are important to us. You know, if your bank, if you want to know what your balance is in your checking account, and your bank says, well, it's somewhere between $10 and $10,000, you might like to have it a little bit more quantified than that, a little bit more specific, Sp you know, Things that are important, get specific. You're asking your boss, should I show up, you know, how many hours am I going to be working next week? Is it 40? That'd be fine. He says, no, it's going to be more like 80. Ouch! Or five. Ooh. You know, you like things quantified. How much is the thing going to cost? How much is the interest rate on that mortgage? And so forth. You go to the doctor's office. They're going to start quantifying immediately. Quantifying making you step on the scales, taking your blood pressure, counting your heart rate, beats per minute, giving you your medication, how many milligrams, how many times a day. Quantify, quantify, quantify. Everything gets quantified. Things that are important to us get quantified, right? Absolutely. 
How do you quantify a walk with God? You give yourself four out of five stars. I'm not perfect, but I ain't half bad. How do you do that? In some respects, you can see, you know, Jesus believed in quantifying. In the New Testament, he talked about the person, the shepherd had 100 sheep, but then he only counted 99. He's missing one, he goes out and looks for him. The lady who had 10 coins, missing one, she goes looking for it. Little boy with a sack, five loaves, two fishes for 5,000 people. Quantify, quantify, quantify. Jesus believed in quantifying. Quantify a walk with God. Ask yourself the question and make it known to others. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart? Yes or no? Have you accepted him as your savior? That you have sin, you want him to take it away and you know you can't do it by yourself. Tell him, pray it, know that you've done it. Quantify. Have you been baptized? Surrender your life. Have you figured out what your testimony is? What God has done for you so you can tell it to somebody else? Crystallize it down. Quantify. Part of a ministry, either at the church building or away from the church building. You know, help kids cross the street at school. Take people on rides to their doctor's office or whatever it happens to be. Quantify what are you doing actually? What is your prayer list? What book are you reading of scripture? Quantify. You know, we talked a couple of weeks ago. When you go to worship, make sure you do two things, right? Learn one thing, bless one person. Quantify. If it's important, we quantify. God believes in it. The second thing he gets in, second part he gets into, he talks about the way things used to be, the way we were. It talks about a covenant, verses five through seven, that he had with Levi. And when we read this, we should understand it not to mean specifically a covenant that he had with the patriarch Levi, from whom the Levites got the name for their whole clan. But it really is talking about the whole clan that served in the temple, not just one guy named Levi. And why I'm saying that is simply this. If you go back to Levi and when he was alive in the book of Genesis, there's only three mentions of him or anything about him in that book. And in all those places it mentions Levi, it's not complimentary at all. And nothing mentions a covenant, nothing. So if there was a covenant between God and a specific guy named Levi, it's a secret between him and Levi because the rest of us have no record of it. The Levites became, so let's look at it as the group of Levites. Sort of like Uncle Sam is not really a person, it's just like America, that kind of concept. So Levi is the Levites. And they were nothings comparatively. I mean, just another tribe, nothing special about them until... Moses and Aaron came along. They were Levites of that tribe, and they're the ones that made the Levites popular or significant with God, especially when the sin of worshiping the golden calf came to pass. Moses, the Levite, was bringing down the Ten Commandments, but Aaron, also a Levite, made a golden calf for them to worship. Moses was mad. Big fight broke out. The Levites ran to the side of Moses, and they knocked some heads seriously that day. Got everybody in line. Good for the Levites. And so there in Exodus 32, verse 29, Moses says to the Levites, he says, then Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own, your sons, brothers, and he has blessed you this day. There really wasn't a whole lot of special about Levites before then. But there was on that day because they stood up with God. Eliezer, a little bit later in the book of Numbers chapter 25, a similar type of thing in which there's sin in the, sin in the uh, group and there is a pestilence going and Eliezer, he knocks some heads too. And he was doing the right thing, but he did it in a violent way and uh, stood for rightness with the Lord. And so anyway, that's what's going on with this group of people. And so 
when we get to this section where he has his covenant with Levi, he says there's five things that they've really done well back in the old days. And what are those five things? Number one, reverence and awe. They were wowed by God. We talk about how we're supposed to worship God or worship God, that worship is a sense in which we ascribe value to God. Does God wow you? It's an important, significant thing to God. Reverence. The second thing that they did, they had true instruction. It's what God called right versus wrong. Not necessarily what, how they applied it, their own personal ideas, what was popular at the time, but just the classic gospel. Like it says later on in this, is that the, um, they're supposed to preserve on their lips, preserve on their lips the teachings of God. Because things come and go, but to hold on to the classic of what God calls us to be. The, um, uh, I can make a, a case regarding, oh, maybe something that shouldn't be called a sin anymore. Let's just make this up, by the way. Let's say coveting. Let's say that I, I could make a case that coveting is not that bad. I mean, it, it is one of the big 10 on the 10 commandments, thou shalt not covet. But coveting is so easy to do. Everybody does it probably many times a day. Oh, wouldn't that be a nice car to have? Oh, wouldn't you like to live in that house? Oh, wouldn't you like to have that thing over there? You want Kids especially, you want to see coveting? Have two little kids walk up to you and give an ice cream cone to one of them, but not the other. You're going to see coveting happen just like that. And yet, since everybody seems to covet, there's a lot of coveters that actually are wonderful people. They really don't hurt a flea. I could say it's really, God, it's not that bad of a thing. But does it matter what I think at all? No. The person who's speaking is supposed to represent what God would have said. And Al Brown, or you, does not know better than the creator of the universe. He knows better. And we stick with what he says. Unchanged. True instruction. Well, the third thing he talks about is he walked in peace and uprightness. Walked in peace. This is a very significant thing, especially for the Levites, because for them, violence was a generational handicap. The first guy, Levi himself in Gen Genesis, it says he was a vigilante type person. He caused a lot of problems that God did not want to get involved in. Basically, he solved his disputes with his fists, with his weapons. Later on, with both at the, the worshiping at the golden calf, as well as with Eleazar, they uh, solved problems, violence. And yet somewhere along the way, the Levites realized God wants peace from us, not violence. And so even though their clan had a reputation, their part of the demographic was stereotyped, they stepped away from that. They didn't say value for it. Like, I am what I am. No, you're not. You're supposed to be what God says you to be. And they stepped away from it. It's important for us as well. I mean, there are different generations that are known for self-absorption or, or workaholics or whatever. There's lots of stereotypes out there from different parts of the demographics that make up modern society. And God is not asking us to be true to who we are. No, he's asking us to deny ourselves. That's the opposite of it. Just like the Levites had to say no to the violence of the past, they had to say, we need to be what God would have us to be, to walk in peace and uprightness. Pretty important stuff. Well, lastly, number four, um, it says he turned many away from sin. The idea of this is kind of connected with what we just talked about. How he lived his life, his walk, his walk with God. Um, a lifestyle, being able to see not just what a person says, which was very important. I mean, if somebody, if your house is on fire, you want a person to come on in and say, your house is on fire, rather than try to do charades, to try to communicate to you through actions what maybe you should do. Your words are important. But it's also saying that your walk is very important and his character, the fruits of his life, all the Levites, helped to turn people away from sin just from watching their character and their fruit. 
A lot of us have had people that impact our lives big time. And we can't necessarily remember a single speech they gave, but we remember their character and we remember the fruit of their lives. And so God calls us to be able to emulate what these Levites have back in the good old days. These things. To be holding on to what was classic. Not what is the trend at the moment. Not what is, is the fad or the bandwagon of the time. No, right versus wrong is today as it was 20 years ago or 100 years ago or 20 years from now or 100 years from now. Holding on to the truth as God's people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help us to be classic, to be timeless, not just to be a fad. We want some significance. Lord, help us to hold on to your standards for our lives and the thrill that comes from holding on. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless.